Well, good morning and special welcome to any guests who are with us this morning. We're glad you've come to worship our God together with us here at Southside. What a, what a great Easter season, the death and resurrection of Christ. We were blessed in so many different ways, and just thank you for all who served uh, in many ways as well. We are grateful for that. This morning, if you would, we're going to take back up in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 9. We're gonna, we have learned that, uh, that we love Christ because he first loved us. And we've been looking at the origin of that love and the source and the reason for that love and the infinitude of that love and also the sovereign nature of that love that God uh, dispenses it on whom he pleases. And we've been working through this chapter for many weeks now. Uh, This morning, we're going to finish up Paul's point as verses 14 through 23 have been kind of an excursus from him answering these, taking on some objections to what he was teaching in verses 1 through 12. And so we will take up now that answer in verses 24 through 29. Let me read it to you, and then we will pray. Verse 24, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it's the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. Let's go to our God and pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the inerrant word of God. It has been inspired by your Holy Spirit. So what we hold this morning is your perfect revelation of who you are, the salvation that you have brought into this world, and even the recipients of who that salvation would be. And so, God, we sit with a reverence. We ask that you teach us and you continue to reveal this beautiful plan and program that you have created this earth for. And so I pray this morning now, open up these words to our minds and our hearts. Let us get it, understand it, and be changed and transformed as we behold such beauty. And so I thank you for it. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So let's finish up Paul's argument in Romans chapter 9. And that demands that I refresh your mind once again with the argument. You can't finish an argument without remembering the argument. So uh, don't give me trouble for long introductions. You need it this morning. We took a break for Easter. So I'm just going to remind you briefly of what the argument is. The argument in Romans 8, Paul said that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. You are secure. You're you're held by Christ. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Just this eternal, beautiful security for the child of God. And then the glaring question, though, comes to mind that has to be answered. For us to rest fully in the promises that God made to us in Romans 1 through 8. And the letter was being written mostly to Gentile believers there in Rome. God's chosen people, Israel, he gave hesedness, this covenantal loyalty and relationship, and made said, I will bless you and I will have relationship with you. And at the time that Paul's writing Romans, most of the Jews are rejecting their Messiah. In fact, some are persecuting Anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, the writer of this book, Paul being the foremost in his former manner of life before seeing Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he says, who are thou, Lord? Or before he crucified, he wanted to kill anyone who, who called him Lord. And now he's the one, the best defender of the gospel uh, in the world at this point. And so if I am to rest in the full promises of Romans 8, that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I need some help with Israel because it doesn't look like God can keep his people safely to glory. From church history, I'm looking at it going, he can't keep his people. 
And so eternal security needs to be clarified. If I'm going to bank on this and rest on this with all of my hope uh, and direction and heart for the rest of my days. And so we get an amazing answer to that. Uh, My heart feels like the pen of a ready writer. It just is overflowing with a good thing. And so what we're going to look at is how we can rest, trust, and have confidence that God's purpose for me cannot be thwarted. I, I, will, I will make it to the celestial city and be blessed forever, guaranteed by the grace and power of God. Let's look at the answer. Romans 9, we looked at the accusation, our outline. Accusation in verse 6, it's not as though the word of God has failed. It's not as if God isn't finishing what he purposed and what he planned. It's all going perfect. In 9.6b, we looked at an axiom, a, a truth. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So it isn't just because you're, you're born of, of Jewish flesh that makes you the children of God. It's that you've got to be born again to be brought in as a child of God. And so he wants you to realize not all Israel is the true spiritual Israel. The argument in verses 7 through 13 is, is Isaac was chosen, not Ishmael. And he was born to a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old wife who was barren. And then he took two twins and showed us Jacob and Esau. He said, before they had done anything good or bad, God's choice, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And we began to look at this election that is the only thing that can accord with God's free grace of how he wants to give this gospel, that it's not based on your merit, your performance, who you are. It's based purely on the freedom of God to show mercy to whom he desires to show mercy. And then that's going to bring some arguments, and that's going to bring antagonists. And we began looking in verses 14 through 23 at the justification of God for acting this way in history. And Paul pulls out the big guns, no holding back, and he left us speechless in his arguments. The first argument, that's not fair. That's not fair. And all God can do is what is just. Everything he does is right. And he, then he showed us Moses saying, God, show me your glory. And his glory, the very glory of God, as I will have mercy upon him, I have mercy, and I will have compassion upon I have compassion. The very thing that shines and shows God's glory is his freeness to give salvation to whoever he pleases. Second argument, how can he still find fault for who could ever resist his will? How could God find fault when he hardened Pharaoh? How could he find fault? And his answer was threefold. The first one, let's just start again and get in the right place. He's God and you're man. And quit telling God how he has to act, how he has to be according to our reasoning and our thinking. And he just says, who are you, Anthropos? He talks back to Theos. So I just want to begin by saying, let, let God tell you how he'll run his universe. Come humble as a created one under that. And then second, he takes this potter, this analogy with a lump of clay and says the potter can take from that clay one lump, a lump for honorable use and one for dishonorable use. The potter has that right. Clay has no right to say, hey, you can't do that. You can't make me that way. It's just the potter can show off all of his skill and brilliance and beauty by any way he wants with that clay. And he brings us into that. And then he takes us into the divine workshop And he says the sovereign potter has the right to take from the lump of humanity one for honorable use and one for dishonorable use. And we looked at those verses in verses 22 that the reason there's justice and wrath and hell is so that it can serve God's mercy and put it on display for those whom he gives it to so that you'll treasure it, you'll know what it is, you'll You'll give the rest of your life to this God who has shown you mercy. And so there is a black velvet of of justice and wrath so that his mercy could be put on display for all of eternity. And in Romans 11, he's going to say, the way I've run all of history with Jews and Gentiles is so I could show mercy to all. And this morning, we're going to throw open that mercy of his plan and his purpose to take it to the nations. And so overwhelming stuff. This morning, we'll look at our fifth point, then we look at the answer. And now he's going to come back to his argument after that excursus in verses 24 
through 29, it's not as though the Word of God has failed because this is His purpose. This has been His purpose from before the creation of the world. God's not failing. His purposes are not not happening. Just come and look at the answer. Let me read verse 23 again. And He did so (coughs) to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, lumps that he pulled out to show mercy and give salvation, and he prepared them for glory beforehand. Before the foundation of the world, he did that. So vessels of mercy. Who makes up this lump, this lump of vessels of mercy? And in verse 24, now he tells us, who's going to make up that lump? Even us. Even us. And the us are any who have faith in Jesus Christ, all that we've traveled through Romans 1 through 8. Any who believe in Jesus, who look to him for their salvation, will be saved. And so now he says, even us, the lump, anyone who will believe in Christ are the ones who will be saved. And our passage today tells us, guess what? What we've been looking at, it's not just a Jewish lump. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But there's also Gentiles In this lump that God chose to pour out his mercy and grace upon all the nations are included in the plan and purpose of God from the beginning of the world. The nations are not plan B, but plan A. So what great argument and genius to bring this whole argument back to why he took up Romans chapter 9. Eternal security for the Gentiles. He's been writing to this Gentile church, and he wants you to see God's going to finish you. He's going to bring you to glory. He's not going to lose you. And then he shows God's purpose with the Jews and his salvation in chapter 9. And now he will show that Gentiles as well were in the plan of God. And that even the Jews' current rejection of Jesus is the plan of God. And it's to graft you into these promises of salvation through the promised seed, Jesus Christ, and be saved. And Paul will show from the Old Testament that this was God's plan and purpose thousands of years before. Gentile believer, you were in the mind of heart of God when he planned this. And it should just make your security in Christ abound all the more. Just rejoicing free saints held securely and sweetly by God's grace and his purpose. You shouldn't wake up shaking and fearful, but rather bold and courageous in the hand of God. His purposes are unfolding daily in the world for this plan. I read the news and I rest because it's the reporting of how God is bringing this plane to a beautiful landing where he's going to be praised and worshiped forever for this eternal plan that he has decreed. And that is what I want for you is bedrock confidence and trust in your security in Jesus Christ and all the fruit that flows thereof. That produces holiness. And I want you to have it as deep as God is laboring to give it to you in these verses. So Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is fighting for you to have this confidence in God and his salvation. So the answer to Paul's argument from Romans 9, there's a lump that God makes for honorable use, vessels of mercy, And in that lump is Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And in that lump is Gentiles, you and me. Believing ones here this morning are in that lump. It's the called ones from among the Jews. It wasn't just because your flesh was born. It's the called ones that are part of this promise. And it's the called ones from among the nations, Gentiles, that are a part of the promise. It's God who calls. We're right back to Romans 8. The God who takes the lump and he acts to bless it eternally, to pull you out of lostness and wrath of his estrangement from God and to work through Jesus Christ to deliver you and bring you safely to him. And both are brought into that chain of grace that we looked at in Romans 8, whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and whom he predestined, he called. And whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, he glorified. Once you are in God's hand, his grace, nothing can pull you out of it. You are so safe. God loses none of his children. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Some of you just need to hear that this morning. 
Let this make Romans 8 all the more of a pillow to your soul. It's amazing. I love studying the Word of God. Let's dig in. Wait, one last thing. I think this is important. God's creating for himself a bride to give to his son, and it's going to be from both Jew and Gentile. And at this point in redemptive history, this is shocking. And I want to share what both groups were thinking because it might help with what some of you are thinking this morning. And then we'll look at our text. The Jews are saying, we're, we're all Abraham's offspring. We're, we're in. We were, we were circumcised. We're, we're the people of God. <laughs> we're all in. And that thinking is still alive, man. We're all Baptists or Lutherans or we're all baptized. And we still think my God, Christians are our parents. And so I'm in. I, I, I've got all this privilege. We're, we're in. We're Americans, man. We're the West. We, we're in. And then the Gentiles are saying we're excluded from the covenants and the promises of God. We have no hope. And some of you are sitting here this morning going, I'm too bad. God could never want me. And I want you to hear the glory of the gospel this morning. Your badness is not greater than his mercy. In fact, he says in Romans 5.20, a few chapters earlier, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It just swallowed up your sin. And so anyone sitting here this morning as a as, as someone just struggling and battling in sin, going, I'm too bad for God. Uh, man, Jesus was the friend of sinners, and his grace can swallow up any sin that you've walked in here with this morning that believe you're believing is keeping you from God. Oh, what a gospel. Amen? Okay, for reals now. That's what he says, kids. For reals now, let's dive into our text. Verse 24. Even to us. God has a remnant, not only physical descendants of Abraham, but spiritual made up of Jews and Gentiles. This free sovereign mercy of God that we've been studying, God can put on a Jew or a Gentile. It isn't just a Jewish lump. And we're going to see in chapter 11, there's a hardening right now over the Jews for a season to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles as children of promise. I was just thinking of a Wesley's song, I don't think he would have liked my view on Romans 9, but his song, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? I get an interest in this blood that was shed on Calvary's tree. That mercy that we've been studying, he says, it found out me, even us. Amazing love, how can it be that, that it found out me, even me, Gentile Ken Murphy, this mercy that is immense and free. I want you to be overwhelmed that that even us is you, believer in Jesus Christ. And so this sovereign mercy is a surprising mercy as well with Jew and Gentile. Last week we looked at Isaiah 53 and we saw the resurrection preached 750 years before he was raised. And just the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. And now the next thing he says in Isaiah 54, 1, I just want you to hear it. This is after Easter. Here's where we're all sitting this morning. Shout for joy, O barren one. You have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the court curtains of your dwellings and spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess nations, and they will resettle, resettle the desolate cities. Lengthen the, the cords, spread it out. The Gentiles are coming in. Re death, resurrection, this gospel is going to go to the nations. Promise, 750 years before, we're going to look at this morning. So there's a surprise to the Jew. Gentiles are being brought in. And the surprise of the Gentiles that I can have a crumb off the table of God's mercy. Gentiles and redemptive history. We, we were without hope. We were without the promises of God through the whole Testament. Alienated and under God's wrath and there's just no hope. And we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the seed, not seed, singular, Jesus. 
has come with a large heart and purpose for the nations. I always say Jonah was, was prejudiced and didn't want to preach the gospel to the Ninevites, so we needed a greater Jonah who has a heart for the nations, and Jesus Christ has a heart for the nations to bring them in. The amazement of the gospel, the ones chosen to be a privileged nation, the one that God himself dwelt with in the Holy of Holies, they're on the outside for the most part at this point. And the ones on the, on the, on the outside um, are now being brought near into the favorable presence of God, justified and adopted. The outsiders are coming in and the insiders are on the outside. It's a reversal. And the reason being next week is what do you do with Messiah? Do you crown him or do you crucify him? Mercy is being broadened. The riches of God's mercy found out me. So Paul is showing that this turn in the objects of God's mercy is not the plan of God failing or his ability to keep a race in relationship, but that all is going perfectly according to his plan. And the expanded objects of mercy, you and me, are his plan. Praise be to God that it found out me. So because the purpose of God to do it this way, all who will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And Paul said, therefore, I'm a debtor to all men to go tell all men of this free sovereign grace that I have received. I'm eager to come preach the gospel in Rome, and I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It's the power of God to save. It's the mercy of God being offered to you to have your sins washed away and be accepted by God. What this should mean to us is we are alive then to advance the kingdom of God. The kingdom at this time is ushering in the Gentiles. And so we're to go and take this message of mercy to every tribe, tongue, and nation. The good news, elect from every tribe, and heaven will be made up of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so guys, we live in the great harvest, the great ingathering. And because of God's mercy, we have received grace upon grace. And so give our time, our talents, and our resources to this one aim. It's bigger than I go to work, I pay my bills, I raise my children, and I go to church on Sundays. You've got to think bigger than that, because God does. It's not, what do I want to do with my life? If you have received mercy, your life is not your own. You're bought with a great price. Spend and be spent for the great harvest and the ingathering of the best message there's ever been. Salvation to all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, every tribe, tongue, and nation. What a day to be alive in. Church, making disciples, uh, discipling children, next generation, our whole thing is to spread and deepen this gospel. America needs the gospel. The world needs the gospel. Your family needs the gospel. Choose where you're going to spread it, but get off the sidelines. This is our calling to spread this message. That's what these words mean to us, to me, even us. Aren't those beautiful words? Even us. I love them. Well, let's go to the next phrase. Whom he also called. It's going to be a long sermon. <laughs> Whom he also called. So God doesn't just call that into being which does not exist. Remember Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, he calls them into being. But he also calls into being that which doesn't exist in Gentiles. Let's, Eric, live. Dale, live. Who else is asleep? <laughs> live. He calls into being that which doesn't exist. And Gentiles, we were dead. And he said, live, believe. And that is why I love the free mercy of God so much. I wasn't seeking him. He sought me. He called me. And now I'm his and he is mine. Hallelujah, the Gentiles are engrafted into the tree. That's my hope. My hope for my children and this flock in South Denver and the nations. It's this gospel, right back into Romans 8, 28 through 30. He calls you, and once he calls you, he keeps you, and he brings you to glory. I want to read just a couple of verses in Acts. Acts eleven eighteen. when the gospel starts going out to Gentiles, uh, they're, they're sharing about it, and it says, when the Gentiles heard this, or the Jews... They quieted down and they glorified God, saying, Well, then God has granted to the Gentiles 
also the repentance that leads to life. How, how can we hold them out? God's saving them. He's calling them. This is the new discipline. It's going forth. Let's go. Acts 13, 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many has been appointed to eternal life, believed. God is calling Gentiles to life and faith in Jesus Christ. So what do you think if you're a Jew at this time when Paul's writing this and you hear this kind of talk? <laughs> you're you're going to want to throw rocks at Paul. You're going to disrupt his teaching. You're going to try to put him to death. They made oaths not to taste food until Paul was dead. To tell a Gentile he's a fellow heir of God was blasphemy to them. And here it is in their own Bible. God's saying, this has always been my purpose. And Paul's got to deal with that. And so he's going to deal with it in Pauline fashion. Let's go look at the book. Let's go to the Bible and show you that this is not something I'm making up. God has always said this throughout history. If you want to fight this, he says, you're fighting God. You're fighting your own heritage. So what Paul's going to do now in our, our message this morning, he's going to take four Old Testament passages. We'll move quickly. Two from Hosea and two from Isaiah. And verses 25 through 26 He's going to give scriptural evidence that God has said the Gentiles will be brought into this great salvation. And verses 27 through 29, he's saying the rejection of Israel and being a small remnant was always prophesied. And so the Gentiles are not merely dogs outside of God's plan. So come with me to Hosea 2, 23. You don't need to turn to it. I'm just going to kind of help move you through it. Hosea, a prophet, he's told to go marry a woman who's going to be unfaithful to him. And he's going to show that this is an illustration of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. I've been a husband to you, and all you've done is committed harlotry against me with worshiping other idols. So Hosea marries Gomer, and they have children. First one, they named Jezreel, <coughs> which is, uh, means the motion of a hand used in scattering something into the wind and just throwing it away. It's a strange name for a child. I know a lot of you are pregnant. Do not use Jezreel. God would scatter the people of the northern kingdom of Israel among the Gentile nations as punishment for their sins. And he's going to bring the Assyrians in to come and lay them waste. And the next child, Lo, Ruhamah. Lo means no or not. Ruhamah means loved or pitied. And so when you're scattered, God is not going to show you pity. He's not going to show you love. And the third one is Lo, Ami. Lo, no or not, I'm me, my people. You're not my people. The Jews will cease to, to be his people in a special sense when they're under this judgment and dispersed. And now in Hosea 2.23 and 1.10, all three of those names are mentioned. So the Holy Spirit shows us that this passage is prophetic of what would happen to the Gentiles under gospel dispensation. And so here's the reason I believe this. Uh, verse 24, Paul says, even us, who's the us, whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. So he introduces now, it's the Gentiles, the nearest thing to this verse is now he's talking about this verse in Hosea is going to be that the Gentiles were a part of what was going on in Revelation. Verse 24, uh, or verse 25 through 26, it's expanded. And then in verse 27, there's an adversative, a, a, a but. So the Gentiles, this has been said that this would happen, but with Israel, there was going to be a remnant. And then in verses 30 through 31, he explains uh, why there's Gentile inclusion and Israelite exclusion. But this Hosea quote, as I mentioned, was about the northern kingdom of Israel. And in 722 BC, it came true with the Assyrians. And the promise of renewal of mercy to them and breaking ties with all of them are in this Hosea passage. And so Paul, though, is applying it here to Gentiles who were not a people being called. Now they are a people. They were not loved, and now they are loved. And so what I see Paul doing is possibly analogy. He takes this principle of God, how he dealt with the northern kingdom, and says, now this is how I'm going to do it with the Gentiles. But more likely what I think is Paul is in, in Hosea, the, this prophetic uh, fulfillment and reference to the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 34 is just filled in Hosea. And it's the blessings of what would come in the new covenant 
being poured out upon the Gentiles, and I think that's where Paul's taking this, as the fulfillment of Jew and Gentile being one in Christ. And so the blessings are going to come to all who believe. Peter said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, Gentile, but now you are the people of God. And you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Almost the exact same reference. So I will call those who were not my people, my people. In the little Greek, it says, I will call the not my people, my people, and the not loved, loved. And so I want you to catch this. We once were not his people. By his calling and free mercy and sovereign grace that we've been studying, now we are his people. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the sheep of his hand and the people of his pasture. And I want you to get what he is saying. I am now God's people. I once was not his beloved, and as we saw in Romans 8, now nothing can separate me from his love. And in verse 26, it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. So you were outside Gentiles without hope, and now you're beloved of God, and you are now sons of the living God. Back to Romans 8, the Spirit speaks adoption into your heart. Gentiles, you are now children of God. We who were far off and without hope in redemptive history have been brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we're his people. We're his beloved. We are adopted into the family of God. I'm a living son and daughter of God. I'm the recipient of all that that encompasses now. He's my father, and he is so large-hearted to me. And he's large-handed I'll never lack. Surely his goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I have the omnipotent God and creator of the universe as my father, and he wants to lavish mercy and grace upon me for all of eternity. I'm a, I'm a Gentile now who believes in Jesus Christ and all the mercy of God is going to be poured out on me forever. Don't you love even us? <laughs> I know there's some Jewish believers in here. I've got Lori. Who else? Is there, raise your hand if you're a Jewish believer. Hallelujah. Stand, stand firm in it, man. What a beautiful thing. And so mostly 99.9% .9 Gentile believer, even us. Why? Because the potter has a right to make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for common use. God, this is his glory. He has the freedom to do this. And the reason that Gentiles are now a part of this, the purpose of God. And that's why we stand in grace this morning. And I want to read what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, the Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We were, we were dead. We were eternally under God's wrath. We had no hope. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. We studied that throughout Romans. That in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who were near, whoever he calls Jew or Gentile. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone 
and whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, and whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God and the Spirit. I should take your breath away. Look with me in verse 27 through 29 now. Well, with the adversity of now, the rejection of Israel being a small remnant was always prophesied. And I think the great tragedy of the Bible is that he came to his own and his own received him not. And Paul is going to show that, that even that was foretold in Isaiah 10, 22 through 23. So it says in verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Present tense, he's crying out. It refers to a loud, fervent crying, meaning this, though the physical descendants of Israel be as the number of the sands of the sea, not all the sand will be saved. Just a remnant from it. Just the ones that God chooses. And that is why Christ said to Nicodemus, Jewish blood is not enough, Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be called by God and made alive spiritually to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 11, 5, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice with Israel. And now Paul goes back to Rome, Isaiah 1, 9 and verse 28. Uh, verse 28 for the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. The bulk of the nation will be destroyed by the wrath of God. And Isaiah could have viewed this as the Assyrians or Chaldeans, but Paul's talking now about the church. In Isaiah's day, there were, there were warnings and prophecies. They didn't heed them. Judgment came. Noah's day, they were eating and drinking and marrying, and he's warning them. Boom, judgment comes quick and swiftly. And he says, now those take, who take no heed of God, just living for the scene, whatever you want, judgment's going to come, bam, just like that. Jesus said in Matthew 23, therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So the day will come, and he says it'll be thoroughly and quickly, and it means with speed and finality. The Lord waits long, forbears and silent, and then he suddenly acts in judgment. And in verse 29, just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. And in the Greek, this is what's called a condition contrary to fact, saying unless the Lord had left a remnant, the, the, the people would have been entirely wiped out. Israel would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah unless God had this plan and this remnant. And this future we'll see in chapter 11. Jeremiah 49, 18, he says, Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors, says the Lord, no one will live there, nor will a son of man reside in it. Jude 1, 7, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, uh, chasing the angels, they are exhibited as an example and undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. But God has a remnant chosen by grace. And it's only by the grace of God that all will not be completely destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Without the exercise of God's grace, all of us would have got justice like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just that exalting that mercy again. I deserved to be completely and utterly judged and condemned. May we never get over the amazingness of grace that God showed mercy to me. The most astounding thing in the universe is that there's even one Christian because of the love and grace of God, all because of the Lord of Sabbath, let us bow before him and believe in Christ. And so Gentiles, be amazed. Don't despair anyone here that came in feeling like you're too bad for God. And Jews, be humbled. And don't rest in privilege. And some of you have a whole lot of privilege, little kids sometimes, resting in all the privilege that you have. And I'm telling you, don't rest in anything but Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
And so there is the remnant by the grace of God that loses their life in this world to gain it in the next. And the world will treat us as if we're crazy if we live by faith. But God will treat you as sons and daughters of the living God. And so as we close out from a rich section of Scripture, chapter 9, the last time we were in Romans, I think I had 16 points of application and I didn't get through them all. Um, I just thought today I had 16 more. I just want to close with one point and dwell on it more than just shooting 16 bullets. I guess it's the one that God's been putting on my heart all week while I was just meditating. I pray that you see from this section that God is God. If America needs anything, it's to just come back that he's God. And he has a unique purpose for why he created this world. And it's to manifest his glory by making known the fullness of all of his attributes and the fullness of who he is and to show forth his mercy, to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. And what we just remembered on Good Friday is the lengths that God would go so that he could show us this mercy. He would give his son none on Calvary's tree so that he could send mercy upon us. Don't ever let that become stale or light. And as we close, then, I just want to let our hearts be, just be taken up with God, how he acts, who he is, his beautiful glory, his plan, and just not us. Wouldn't that be freeing? Quit spending all your day thinking about you, the American dream, and all these things, and just be caught up in God. His glory is why this world exists. Everything in this Bible says it's for his glory for his glory, for his glory, for his name. Is that why I exist? I've been saved to be taken up with that purpose. And the fall is us trying to take glory to ourselves and any other created thing. And so what could be a more proof of depravity than how glorious God is? And I want myself to be made much of. Like, is there anything you could say more condemning and how beautiful God is, and what I am, and I, I want to spend all my time on me instead of that. Spending all of our days to have much made about us. Working out and eating so strict so someone might say, hey, you look good. I had someone say, you look good for a 70-year-old. I'm 55. <laughs> So I can either work out more and eat better, or I can just get caught up in what really matters. Maybe mastering a sport, an instrument, your industry at work, so that you could be considered the best. 50 years of service, you were there every morning, every day, and you got a watch. Or fired. I spent my whole life trying to be approved by the elite of society. I'm just giving all my life so people might think I'm somebody or invite me to the right parties, make much of me. I want to do ministry so people see me and notice me or maybe I'm going to make God happy. I want to have a family that's perfect so I can put it on display and everyone can look at me and say, you're good. And if it's not, I'll just put it up on Facebook and fake it. And so I just, this morning, I just want us to look at this chapter. It's so theocentric. It's just God. I've been so refreshed just staring at God, his glory, what he's doing in history, and just marvel at God and get over me. Let it reorient your flesh and your desires, the things you're chasing, wanting more than that glory. Just let it come this morning and get you focused again on him him, his glory, his beauty, his plan. He wants to take it to the world, to Gentiles. I want to get caught up in God and his purposes. And if he wants to put his glory on display, that's all I want to give my life to. I want that to be my chief end. So that I stare at this again and again until I finally say, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. There's nothing that could heal you more than that. I would heal everything you walked in here with, battling and struggling with. 
from him, through him, and to him are all things. We need God. That is the freedom that the gospel brings to quit suppressing and lacking the glory of God and to now treasure and love it and to give our lives to serve it. And acceptance and love and justification, all that he's given us in this gospel. So I pray that Romans 9 at least does that in your heart. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we need you. I want to spend more time gazing into your beauty, seeing your beauty in all things in this earth. God, I just pray that looking at your freeness and your fullness to do as you please and the way you have orchestrated all of history is for this abounding mercy that you desire to pour out on objects of wrath, to act for, to send your son for, to pierce him through for us. God, to raise him for our justification. Lord, we thank you for this plan and that he is now at your right hand enthroned as the king of kings. God, it is going perfectly and now you are lengthening the tent pegs to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. And we sit here this morning just praising you that you called us and you opened our eyes to see Christ as a treasure hidden in a field and we sold all that we could have Christ. We have believed in him. We look to him for our salvation. God, we thank you for such mercy. And I pray, let every heart be full and let every heart be taken up with the glory of almighty God. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.